First of all, I just want to thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Justin Witte. I'm the director and curator of the Cleve Carney Museum of Art. And I want to welcome you to the first lecture of our 2019-2020 uh, Visiting Artist Series. The COD Visiting Artist Series is a collaboration between the Museum of Art and the Fine Arts and Architecture Program. Um, and it has grown each year that we've held it. And I'm very excited for this year to kick off with probably one of the most well-known artists working today across the world, Nick Cave. So today, um, Nick has provided us with a film that he has asked that we start with. Um, so we're gonna first watch this short film that was produced in conjunction with his exhibition at the Cranbrook Art Museum a number of years ago. Um, so I would like to introduce the film now. It is called Upright Detroit. And then once we're done watching, we'll get started with our conversation. Thank you.
are complete. So uh, please join me in welcoming Nick Cave. Um, I'd like to start talking about this film we just saw. Um, it was produced in conjunction with a series of performances and events you did surrounding <coughs> your exhibition at the Cranbrook Art Museum. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? That's um, correct. And when we were in contact with you, it was requested that we start today's conversation with that film. 
Uh, what is the reason for that? Uh, the, the film, or why or to start? Our conversation with that. You know, I think it sort of gives, um, I think for a number of reasons, I think it sort of talks about sort of uh, the sort of collaboration aspect of the work, the sort of work sort of existing in the sort of public sort of realm. Also, it gives the sort of viewer, the audience, this sort of inside of like perhaps how is a sort of in this particular case a sound suit built uh, and the sort of uh, what I'm interest, interested in terms of performance work uh, this in this piece this is working with the Ruth Ellis Center which is LGBTQ uh, trans center in Detroit for youth and so it was very important to, I sort of really sort of spent the day scouting throughout Detroit and just happened upon the Ruth Ellis Center and was like, I want to work with these kids. And uh, it's a, a piece that's really about sort of this sort of rite of passage. Maybe in line with that, the, the song at the end, could you give us a little information about where that, where that comes from? Like, um, I've never heard it before, but I think the, the lyrics were, if I can help somebody as I pass along, if I can cheer somebody with a word of song, if I can lead somebody who is traveling on, then my living shall not be in vain. Can you explain the choice of that, of that music and where it came from? Well, that's uh, an old gospel uh, uh, song, and it's really sort of uh, what I sort of, is sort of rooted within sort of my sort of belief system. So is that, um, in sharing that stars, is that kind of the belief system <clears throat> you also are using when you're making your work? And how does that manifest? Oh yeah, of course. Yeah. It has to be. <laughs> uh, uh, because I think, uh, I think my work, uh, I th well, I'm a messenger first, so I'm not really, so I'm doing my work for the world, and so I have to, so it has to be that kind of sort of commitment and and um, uh, responsibility because you know I'm sort of you know I have to deliver it at some point in order to move on to the next assignment. So, so you talk a lot about your role as a messenger, um, an educator. Uh, I'm curious at what, what process, at what point in your career where that distinction was really clear to you, that what you were doing was really being, delivering a message versus like creating objects or, or just trying to, you know, make things that people might just like to look at. Well, I think it sort of became very clear to me when, uh, it was really in 92, when the Rodney King incident happened. Mm -hmm. uh, which was the LA riots, and it was really uh, when Rodney King uh, was beaten by the LA sort of uh, police, pulled from his car, and this was the first time we really sort of recorded that. Uh, and it was really sort of at that particular moment when, you know, I think I was, I thought I was living in the world where my conscience was awake, and it certainly wasn't mm -hmm. to the degree in which that sort of affected me. And so that's when the first sound suit sort of came to fruition, was really sort of out of that incident. And so then I just, then I, it just sort of, everything started to change. I, I sort of just I started to think more about, uh, you know, what is the role of art within the sort of public realm and, in, in terms of like, you know, how do I use myself as a form of service and just wanted to kind of find a way to sort of um, create space and places and uh, environments for us to have conversations that needed to be had and still need to be had. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit more about that first sound suit? Um, that was created kind of in, in the wake of the Rodney King 
beating. In what way? What do you want well, to know? Well, like specifically, <laughs> you've talked about how you came about um, actually discovering the material and building that, that very first suit and how you viewed it. I was really sort of teaching, I think it was my sort of or second year at the Art Institute. And I just sort of found like my peer group was not having this conversation with me. Okay. It was really just sort of very difficult, I think. And so I just found myself sort of sitting in the park and just sort of trying to kind of process that. And I was just, I happened to look down on the ground and there was a twig and that became the catalyst for the sound suit. I just saw that twig as something discarded, mm -hmm. viewed last then, dismissed. And I then started to, proceeded to collect all of the twigs and then made this sculpture and then found that I could wear it. And then the moment that I put it on, it, it made sound. Mm -hmm. So that's how sounds it really came about was really through the sort of act of building something and then sort of uh, applying it to my body and started to move and it just started to then open up this vast uh, array of ways of thinking about shielding and protecting oneself and yeah, I mean, you've discussed that and other sound suits as a way, as a type of armor, right? Like a, um, a way to shield yourself or a way to shield others from how groups may view them or may uh, not view them. But it's well, I think that and, and just sort of what do we do to sort of to shield and protect ourselves? you know, our sort, of, our sort of internal self. And, and for me, I sort of uh, needed to sort of come up with some sort of strategy or, or some sort of notion of what that sort of meant and in order for me to sort of proceed with my work. Uh, I needed to sort of have a clear sense of how to sort of organize my sort of thoughts and, and uh, my way of sort of existing and, and functioning and uh, at the same time taking in yeah. things as they happen. In, in, that, in that development, I'm curious, um, because I think so many people come to your work are aware of the sound suits as maybe an entry point because they're, they've become uh, so identifiable and, and, and iconic almost. Um, I'm curious from that point where you started kind of discovered this and started making these connections through that, that wearable sculpture, uh, how then over the next number of years you developed, you started to research a lot of different forms that were associated with ceremony or events. I think after the first one was built, I knew that I was in trouble at that moment. <laughs> I was like, you know, just like, oh, S-H-I-T. But um, I was sort of like, the physical sort of act of, of making was so much further along than what was really sort of presented in front of me. So I had to, so, you know, I sort of did probably a dozen, okay. Uh, but I sort of just sort of kept them all in the closet because I wasn't mentally there yet in terms of what, what have I just sort of created. I knew it was something that would change my life. I don't know why, but I could sort of tell as it sort of was in front of me and I just needed to sort of catch up. And that's with a lot of things. I mean, you know, I'm thinking I'm making a sculpture, but now it's on my body. So I'm like, what, well, what does that mean? Right. Uh, and so I'm thinking about like, you know, this as an object, as this sort of free, sort of standalone, sort of sculpture static. And yet I'm like, but I can wear it, I can wear it, I can wear it at the same time and sort of like, okay, there's a lot of things that need to be sort of, uh, 
sort of worked out and to sort of to understand the breadth of the possibility that uh, this sort of work uh, can offer. And so I think that sort of made me sort of, I, I started to think about my work in terms of, I started to really think about like, I make work, but I think more about like options. Like, I don't want it to be just sort of one thing. I want it to sort of operate in multiple sort of ways that, you know, that allows me to kind of stay fluid in, in my practice. Um, but, you know, with, the, with that particular body of work, you know, I started to do research really sort of looking at uh, ideas of transformation, looking, spending time in Trinidad at Carnival, going to, spending a great deal of time in, in South Africa, Ghana, uh, Dakar, really sort of, in, in sort of doing this sort of heavy research around uh, ritual and, and ceremonial sort of performance and, and what does that mean and what does that look like? And um, thinking about ideas of formats and, and presentation and. Well, I think and movement, right? How, how the pieces move is such a big part of how I experience them, right? We, when I really look at some of the performances I've seen or videos, what's amazing is even though the uh, performer is so disguised by the suit, um, the, the movement of, of their human, very human form of their body is accentuated by the suit itself. So there's almost a more direct connection to them um, through identification of that movement. Um, and I'm curious, when you are, are considering these suits, like, do you imagine them moving first, or are you imagining just the, the the suit itself, and then the movement comes second. I think it's really sort of uh, the object first. Okay. Always, I don't know why. I think it uh, because I think that in order for me to even build it, I have to sort of think about it. I think about it. I think more sort of as an object sculpture first, and that it, you know it has to stand alone as that, mm -hmm. and then I think about the possibilities of what else it can perhaps provide. How does that, um, how does that then relate to the, the presentation of the work and the difference between how you view the gallery or museum presentation of the work where they are objects very still and these performances uh, or events where you, you know, go out into the public and they're activated? Well, I think, you know, they're, you know, I'm just installing a, a new sound suit at Art Expo. I haven't done a sound suit in probably 15 years, but it's the next level sound suit, um, and it's a sculpture, so it's not meant to be worn. So it's a different set of rules, a set of, of uh, sort of uh, ways in which things are sort of made. So it, it sets up for a different way of sort of construction mm -hmm. uh, than if it's a static object, then I can kind of handle it in a much different way and bring a different level of material to the work that doesn't sort of, uh, that can, as opposed to a, a performance suit, it's, you know, there's a lot of stress mm -hmm. that sort of uh, transfers into, into the object. So I think very differently about the two sort of principles of, of those two practices. Is there one that you, um, obviously you said that they are all these objects and they're exquisite objects. Um, but the interaction from the audience is, is very different, right? Um, towards that kind of contemplative museum or gallery setting where they're I, hopefully like a slow inspection and discovery of the work 
where kind of the layers of, of detail and building reveal themselves once people get past the whole form. And then kind of the, um, these exuberant um, otherworldly performances that you've, you've created. Um, how would you uh, define like the importance for, the, for me as a viewer? Are you hoping that I receive different things from those two different experiences, or is it all folded into the same? Well, yes, it's all folded into the same, but I think the two differences is that, and my preference would be, I think, the more static, mm -hmm. uh, because I think I like the fact that I can get into this headspace of imagining what it would be like on the body, okay. uh, and sort of, you know, where my head sort of goes with that sort of thought. Um, I just like that something can sort of motivate me to sort of think in that sort of way, as opposed to performances, it's sort of, you know, it, it's all sort of handed to you here, this is what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just sort of feeding you this sort of idea, the project, what have you, uh, to some degree. Um, but I, I don't know, I just sort of, uh, I've always, it's always been a, it's, you know, the origin has always been a, a sculpture first. Uh, speaking of the sculptural work, uh, around the same time of, of this performance that we saw, um, there's a, a piece that you made that, that, that I'd like you to maybe describe and talk about, um, and that's a TM13. Uh, Could you explain what that, that work is? Uh, TM13 was Drew by Martin in the year 13. Um, and so, you know, the thing that's interesting is that I think about, like, Trayvon Martin, I think about uh, Michael Brown, uh, you know, uh, these sort of moments that continue to sort of, in these incidents that continue to sort of trigger uh, and feel the work. Uh, Michael Brown was, you know, that incident, uh, out of that incident came until the Mass Smoker Project. Um, but, you know, I'm in the studio sort of working, and, uh, and when, when the Michael Brown incident happened, I was sort of, this thought came across my mind, and that was, is racism in heaven? And so that's how my Mass Smoker projects jumped off. You know, the curator comes a year later. She's like, you know, I'm giving you Gallery 5, which is sort of the size of a football field, uh, and I'll be back. <laughs> and so I'm not really thinking about, like, the project, but that incident just sort of led me to that thought. And then, I, so I started to then imagine, like, this, extraordinary crystal cloudscape that was sort of uh, heaven. Mm -hmm. uh, and part of that project was that you had to sort of, there was this sort of, oh, I can't even, I don't even know what the size of it was. It's like enormous, probably easily the width of this sort of space here and as probably as big as, as this whole this space here as well. And so this hovers above your head, but you are able to get to the access to the top by climbing these ladders. But within that same sort of installation is uh, this field of wind spinners mm -hmm. that creates this sort of amazing force that you have to you find your, say, your way yourself moving through and you come to this crystal cloudscape. But the spinners are all images of guns, bullets, and teardrops. Okay. But as you enter the space, you don't even realize that. You're like, it's so spectacular that you're just like, oh my God. And then you're just hit in the stomach with the sort of very direct images, so which, you know, for me it was like, I wanted to use that spinner because it was sort of really sort of talking about how close it is to us as individuals. You know, it's right in our backyards. 
uh, what's happening. Yeah. Uh, and so, uh, but TM13, you know, th again, it's like, I think I thought about Rodney King, the piece I did, mm -hmm. you know, in 92, here I am again doing TM13. So it's unfortunate, but. Is it, uh, would it be accurate to say, like, because when I think about that, that piece and some of the uh, work you'd, you showed at Jack Shaman in the, in the year before and the following years, um, is it accurate to say that that sort of, um, those thoughts you're having, having to be confronted with the same kind of reality all these years later, and kind of the, the political climate in this country surrounding that became much more uh, upfront in some of the pieces. Um, yeah, I think it's at one point I decided to sort of reveal myself from the sound suit mm -hmm. and really just started to like, you know, instead of like it shielding me, I just decided to like just rip it open and just sort of come out and like, you know, like let's really like get into it. Yeah. Uh, and that was sort of, uh, that was me sort of also sort of moving forward, moving on with, uh, you know, putting the sound suits behind me and sort of moving forward with thinking about different forms, different sort of materials. Uh, but still, you know, I was very much, still very much interested in using that, uh, content and what does it look like in in a different form um so back to the until um exhibition which um if, if none of you have seen it before yeah you should definitely check it out it's just uh monumental i think is too small of a word for this installation that uh, was at mass mocha and then it, at uh, carriage works in australia and then is actually opening at crystal bridges oh wait it's in where is it's it right in now? in Scotland Scotland, right now. and then to Crystal Bridges. 2020. And uh, one of the many things that's phenomenal about it is that even though the scale is massive, the, the, the kind of scale of the objects is still made of the small elements, beads, found objects, the spinners. And, I mean, how did you go about even planning something that scale out of some elements so small? I mean, it just seems overwhelming. You know, I think uh, once I sort of had that sort of core sort of form there, I um, I don't I just, I think it's me sort of like, you know, trying to sort of connect content with material language and what makes sense, what do I use, uh, how can I sort of, sort of, sort of tell this sort of story in this sort of, uh, this very sort of traumatic sort of story uh, in a very sort of compassionate sort of way. Uh, you know, how can I sort of talk about, how can I sort of create a, a safe space for a difficult sort of subject? Um, and so again, I think it's all sort of, uh, and then at the same time, the curator said to me on that visit, there's only one stipulation, no sound suits. So I was already sort of working out of that anyway. Yeah. And so for me, this is me sort of putting you into the belly of a sound suit, okay. that exhibition. So it's really like what fuels me to do what I do. And so it's me sort of, again, opening up that sound suit and just letting it just sort of come out and that's what it looks like so that the element of the that exhibition that you mentioned that like in a number the center of the spinners the the bullets the guns and the teardrops and um, different elements throughout the show you reference that in relationship to how we um, we all live with violence um, in a way that it's kind of folded into our everyday landscape. There's um, a familiarity that we almost overlook it. Um, and I, I, I wonder that in a way of presenting that, 
through that show and creating a space to bring people together to have that conversation. Um, if that you feel has led to a change in the conversation surrounding those issues, specifically uh, related to, we were talking backstage that I was really interested that one of the authors who wrote an essay for the catalog for the exhibition was Lori Lightfoot, the now mayor of Chicago. Um, at the time, she wasn't the mayor, but her, her contribution talked a lot about violence in the city and its impact on the residents, um, on the police force, on the city itself. Knowing that you are, are good friends with Lori Lightfoot and, and that you have done a lot of projects in Chicago and, and through other communities that allow for this conversation to happen, allow for a space mm -hmm. uh, for this conversation to happen, do you feel that those conversations are starting to have effect in communities beyond kind of the sphere of the art world? Yes, uh, and I think uh, I think, you know, I go into, you know, the sort of, that sort of part of my work, uh, uh, with the intent that, um, I think more about like impression, like how can I leave an impression? And so, I tend to sort of create these sort of projects that that puts you in that sort of space that sort of allows you to be in this sort of space that sort of transforms, transcends you to a different way of existing. Uh, and then folded, folded within that is all uh, the sort of civic work that is built in the sort of project from the top. Uh, and so, you know, when you think about like, oh, you know, I went to this Nick Cave installation, but then you also sort of understand the purpose of it because you were part of uh, a civic sort of, uh, sort of town hall or, or experience. So it's, you know, you know, I've always been interested in sort of how can I use the work as a, a vehicle for change. Uh, and also I think working within community, like all of my performance work, you know, we tend to like go to a city, but we hired the city to build the project. So yes, I can bring everyone with me, but it's not interesting. What's interesting is for me to sort of, you know, pull up my sleeves and get into the trenches and discover like who lives here and you know, how can I sort of fold them into uh, developing a project? How can I sort of create sort of space for them to sort of see what's possible? Uh, and so it really becomes this sort of grass root built experience that uh, is life changing for me. I don't think you can come away from your work without feeling that generosity, I think, in the making of the work, because the, the exact nature and detail in which the objects are made, um, from kind of the first taking in of the forms down to the detail, they're just exquisite, and that's generous and giving in that way with the time and the consideration and that experience. But then the generosity of of allowing space uh, around these conversations, because I think a lot of artists are drawn into address these topics because they are so relevant at this moment, along with so many other seemingly overwhelming uh, topics. But then having that, again, that generosity to allow the conversation to happen. And I think another area that seems um, so generous that comes away from your work is the, that there's hope folded into all of the work as well. Um, and with that in mind, I, I'm wondering if, if you could describe and, and explain uh, a piece you had in the show, If a Tree Falls, which was a sculptural show 
that had some really difficult, very direct work that dealt with kind of the political situation we find ourselves in now. Um, but I want to ask you to, to describe and talk about the, the piece Unarmed. Unarmed. Uh, uh, you know, that piece, uh, it's really sort of, really was sort of uh, the sort of lead in to the Mass Mocha project. And so Unarmed is sort of a sort of bronze uh, sculpture that sets on a sort of shelf and then built around sort of, it's a bronze sculpture. So my hands are sort of, if I was holding a handgun, my fingers are a particular way. So it's, it's sort of like this. And so then around here, around there is this sort of beaded wreath that sort of uh, frames that. Um, and that's really sort of me sort of paying homage to all of those that have sort of lost their lives. And uh, by sort of creating this sort of uh, piece, you know, where the gun is invisible was something that I really was sort of interested in, sort of like, uh, and with the sort of, and particularly the focus here was sort of, you know, all of the sort of unarmed black men that have been sort of shot and, and killed. Uh, and so it was really sort of, that was sort of the sort of catalyst for. The, the gesture of that hand though, with the, with the, with the gun removed, um, also is like kind of a reaching out and like a, a welcoming form, like the, once you, the removal of that gun, was that kind of an intentional idea as well, or is that? Well, it was, yes, but you know, it was this, uh, I think it was, I could say sort of a form of sort of uh, a sign language, I would, I would say. Okay. Um, I do have some questions that, that our students have put together for you that we've compiled. So these will cover a lot, uh, a lot of different areas. But we decided to do this way so a lot of the classes who have been studying your work have a chance to, uh, to get their questions across to you. Um, so I'm just going to go through them. So the first one is in relationship to your exhibition, Rescue. Mm -hmm. um, and the student asked that the center focus on the show is often on ceramic dogs sitting on furniture with an elaborate dreamlike dance. What do dogs mean to you in this project? Oh my God, this is an interesting project. So, you know, what I tend to do is like when I'm resourcing is, you know, me and my friend Bob Faust will jump on an airplane, we'll fly to Washington State, one-way ticket, we'll rent a cargo van, We'll put on, pull out our phones and we'll put in like antique mall. And so we'll just antique our way back to Chicago. Oh, wow. So that's how I sort of resource. So <laughs> rescue came out of. I think we all do that. I think that's pretty normal. Yeah, you know, <laughs> let's go tomorrow. Let's just go, let's do it. <laughs> and so rescue came out of, that body of work came out of one of those experiences. Okay. Uh, I, I, we happened to be in an antique mall. Bob's like, you've got to come and look at this dog. And I'm like, oh, God, no. <laughs> like, and I just was like, no, like, I'm not, this, I'm, this, that's not even in my sort of frame of mind. Like, and he's like, no, it's just, you've got to see it. So I went to look at it, and it was like this Doberman about this big that was sort of in this reclining sort of position. And it was amazing. I don't know why. It just had this sort of like early sort of uh, Americana sort of look to him, the way that he was painted. So I was interested in the, the object. But then I said, you know, in order for this to work, I need a gold settee. <laughs> and he's like, <laughs> and so as we were shopping, did I find the gold settee? I'm going to guess yes. I did. Okay. 
So anyway, so we're talking about this gold settee in this antique sort of mall. The salesperson's with us. We're just talking about it. It's, you know, it's a furniture, a piece of furniture. Bob's like, can we bring in our dog? <laughs> so he's like, okay, like what are these two up to? So Bob then brings in the dog, sets him on the go, settee, and then it all started to make sense. Okay. And so what I've been finding is that, and so what I was interested in in that object was, you know, I started to then do research, and particularly like dogs within sort of painting and just what that symbolically sort of represents in terms of, there he is. <laughs> uh, how convenient. <laughs> um, and started to think about dog in terms of loyalty, uh, class, uh, like you're my dog, that sort of, yeah. you know, from this very sort of urban sort of sensibility. And so that began the sort of series of works that sort of came out of that one experience. Uh, and then I wanted to then, once I found the furniture piece, build this sort of den of, of around the object, framing it, uh, sort of creating this sort of safe space for the object as well. So, you know, I'm finding that that's how new work is sort of coming sort of forward is I'm finding that I'm making work in the moment, like when I'm out scouting, like I'll just make some, it's just coming like this and it's like amazing. So speaking of these uh, truckloads of, of items you pick up on your way back from Washington. I'm not a hoarder, by the way. <laughs> Let me tell you, I'm really sure, not. I'm sure you're not. <laughs> <laughs> I am not. Like, where I, my living space is so minimal. But it's really, it takes so much sort of surplus in order to really sort of, really sort of build a piece fully, so. Well, th this next question has to do with uh, your space. So you have a, a large complex on the north side of Chicago um, called Facility, uh, which is your workspace, but also a performance space. I mean, an uh, exhibition space, a community space. And the student asks, um, do you see the facility as an extension of your practice or a space for it? If an extension, what are your plans for developing that realm of your work? I think it's an extension from the perspective of possibility that it's, you know, facility is a, is a, a studio uh, space, but it also is a project space uh, that allows uh, us to curate, to sort of invite artists to come in and uh, do installations, video work, performance work, uh, but it's a, you know it's a revolving sort of uh, system, so it's never nothing's ever permanent. Uh, but it's really about sort of a window into what's possible for artists. Uh, we know a lot of artists, designers that are like amazing, but just never have had a break, and so we're interested in sort of uh, hosting that kind of space and. And then it's also a non-for-profit, so we're working with uh, Shoals High School, which is across the street, creating scholarship for young artists uh, and other sort of projects throughout the city, working with public uh, CBS schools, so. That's awesome. Uh, kind of in line with, with having this large space and you have like a great team that works with you there. Um, there was a number of questions from students who were really curious about, you know, how you got started. I think there's an impression when they research you, right away they see all of your, you know, they see Until and they see all the shows and there's a sense that like, well, you started, you made a sound suit and then you had the show at Mass like, Mocha. Boom, it was magic. Yeah. <laughs> Not. Um, so since this was a really common question with a lot of students, I wonder if you could talk about um, really how you got started from undergrad on and that development as an artist prior to the points that are very well known about your, your work and your career? 
You know, I think as an undergrad student, you know, I was very uh, sort of crazy and amazing at the same time. <laughs> and, you know, just sort of in it with, you know, this sort of collective sort of group of students that were really sort of about sort of making sort of things happen, uh, creating happenings. And, you know, I was always, I realized I've always collaborated. Maybe I wasn't sure what that was, but I've always sort of, you know, undergrad, I would like print, screen print fabric, make 20 things. Well, I need 20 people to wear them, right? And so there we would then do a, a you know, a procession sort of downtown. So I'm sort of like, what does that mean? What, what am I doing right now? So I've always sort of been sort of working and realizing that, you know, my sort of uh, platform, it's sort of, uh, you know, it's outside of the studio and yet it may be in a gallery and sort of these sort of two sort of spaces that are sort of accessible. Uh, but, you know, I, you know, I had to get a job because, you know, my parents were like, we're done. <laughs> and uh, you have to take care of yourself. And so, you know, I mean, let's be practical. So I had an eight to five. Uh, but I also had a studio. And I would go to the studio from like six until 11 every day. Uh, sometimes I went for months and I didn't do anything, but I was just there. Uh, I've always made stuff. I wasn't really thinking about a gallery or any of that. It just wasn't something that, you know, of course I thought about it, but it wasn't sort of tangible at, the, at that moment. But, you know, I stuck with a group of sort of artists that we would sort of, like, we would then have these ongoing critiques, which was also a way in which we could all get fed. <laughs> so, like, a critique would be at your house, and so it was like potluck. So, <laughs> you know, we were able to feed each other, like, oh, my God, let me tell you. Uh, and uh, just was sort of, you know, stayed very connected in, you know, group shows. And, you know, you can, a group show can be anywhere. Right. I mean, you can push your, oh, your living room furniture into your bedroom and you have a gallery. So it's not like you cannot show this work and have uh, sort of people have access to, to the work. Uh, and so we just sort of kept ourselves very present and connected in that way. And also, you know, at the galleries and, and, and at openings and things like that. But I was like a gypsy, like an artist gypsy for like 15 years. What that means is that, you know, I would have a project here, I would pack all my stuff, and then I would just move on to, you know, to the next thing. So it was not that I was really looking for a gallery, I was just really more just interested in just sort of, sort of being committed to my practice um, and just sort of invested in, in that way. You know, and it was something, and it was bigger than me. Yes, I have artist friends that sort of threw in the towel, but that wasn't possible for me. You know, I tried to fit into corporate America. It just didn't work. Yeah. I was, I was just what, what, not. Can I ask what, I was what just part of not corporate? happy. <laughs> it was working. I wasn't happy. Yeah. And so, you know, when I told my mother that, she was like, oh my God, this kid. <laughs> like, he's got a great job, he's got insurance, and he is not happy. Like, <laughs> and so once you start to put that, understand that, you, you start to realize that, and I realized that what makes me the happiest is doing my work. And so I had to sort of figure out how am I going to sort of design my life where that can all be possible. 
So then I went to grad school. I told my mother I'm going to grad school. She said, you're on your own. I don't know, <laughs> figure it out. And I sort of did. You know, so I went to Cranbrook, full scholarship. Uh, and then I was there for two years. And uh, you know, I had like amazing professors that were no joke. Like Cranbrook was sort of like, it was a two year program, but you know, you got reviewed every year. Second year could graduate or you could be asked to stay a third year. Your first year you could be asked to go forward or to leave the campus. <laughs> and I was like, I'm not staying another year and I am moving forward. <laughs> so that was already sort of in set in, in stone. And so what that meant was performance. Okay. It's all about output and just really producing work. And so, you know, I had professors that, you know, we would, they would sort of like, this is the crit space. And so what does that mean to you? You know, you've got like four walls. Why would I bring one piece to critique? Why not fill up all the walls? And so it's this way of sort of being sort of what's been brought to your attention and what, uh, and also, you know, I sort of, it's nice to have someone that you want to impress. So therefore, your, your standards of working is always sort of up here. Not that it always works, trust me. There's yeah. been, you know, devastation moments. <laughs> <laughs> but that's just part of building your character and getting back up, picking up the pieces and getting back in the game. I mean, that's... That is this industry, that's what it takes, um, but it's extraordinary at the same time. Um, so you didn't just get uh, discovered right out of undergrad? <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, we have time probably just for one more question here. And, um, another question that came up from a lot of our students is, what role does Chicago have in your practice now, now that you, even though you're not from Chicago, it's definitely where you've settled. Um, and how you feel your relationship with the city informs your work? Well, I think just, you know, I made the decision to settle in Chicago. Yes, I could be in New York. I'm there probably 60% of the time. Anyway, but I've chosen to stay in Chicago. I'm also a professor at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Um, I'm also created, you know, facility, which is this not-for-profit. So, you know, there's, you know, I'm interested in giving money away to young artists, you know. Do you know what it was like when, like, I got, like, $1,000 at, like, 22 years old? Like, was, like, life-changing. So it's that kind of thing, like, just, you know, I'm interested in giving back and, and, and sort of... Uh, you know, like working, like the first project that we're doing with the school that's right across the street from facility is that we're going to sort of do their first sort of art exhibition in facility, which is, you know, a gallery sort of setting. And for just the kids to sort of see it out of, off the walls, off the, you know, the walls of the classroom and into the setting. I mean, that's, that's, those are the things that are sort of life-changing. Those are the things that make you sort of see what's possible uh, when you take things out of context. And so Do you I'm feel interested that, uh, in Chicago and what it has to offer. And, you know, there's a, there's a world out there, but there's this amazing city that is very open to for artists to sort of be engaged in. Uh, well, I know we've, we've quickly run out of time here. <laughs> so uh, I would like you all to join me in thanking Nick Cave for coming Thanks. to talk to you today.